All right, so before we get more into this, let's talk about the bad side. <clears throat> this is a growing problem in the United States is mortgage fraud. And mortgage fraud is defined as a material misstatement, misrepresentation, or an omission of information relied upon by a lender to fund a loan secured by real property. All right, so go back through there and look at that. It's a material misstatement, which is a really nice way of saying a lie, a misrepresentation, you're giving false information, or the omission of information, like you failed to mention a bankruptcy, relied upon by a lender or a mortgage broker or a mortgage loan originator to fund a loan either for the purchase or the refinance of any uh, real property that is being used for security. That is the definition of mortgage fraud. Now, <clears throat> there's mortgage fraud. Simply put, is mortgage fraud a crime? Well, the answer is yes. It's considered a white collar crime, but here's the big bad thing. Anytime you make a statement that is relied upon as proof for information of a loan. So if you make a statement about I make a hundred grand and the lender uses that information to, to secure the loan, that's mortgage fraud. But here's the kicker in this whole thing that I think is worth well noting. Yeah, it's a crime <laughs> and you're going to pay, dude, up to 30 years in federal pr prison and a million dollar fine. 30 years. You could have paid off the loan in the time that you're going to be serving in prison. So, yes, it is a very serious crime that is punished by very high stakes. And I know at one point, the FBI had an office here in Indianapolis specifically looking for that. So who can commit mortgage fraud? Well, despite what you think, virtually everybody inside of the deal can commit mortgage fraud. There are ways for every one of these people to commit mortgage fraud. <clears throat> and we're going to go through that. So you need to understand that it is not just a lender that is committing mortgage fraud. It is not just the appraiser. Typically, it involves a couple of people, but it could be anybody in the deal. Now, the other thing that's most important here on this slide is this. Oh my God, <laughs> look at that cat. Uh, I saw that picture and I thought, well, I just got to have that in here. So <clears throat> what types of mortgage fraud are there? Well, there are several types of mortgage fraud. All right. There is this type called fraud for profit. In fraud for profit, the key here is that a person, and it usually involves insiders. It involves collusion by somebody like a bank officer, the appraiser, a mortgage broker, a loan originator. Uh, it focuses on misusing the lending process to gain cash out of the deal or skim the equity from the actual lender. There's also this thing called fraud for housing. Now, fraud for housing is probably one of the most typical ones that you see. And fraud for housing is typically when the buyer or the supposed buyer is motivated to acquire the homeowner, to become a homeowner. That fraud for housing can actually be broken down into several different types of fraud for housing. One of the most common ones that you see is what's called occupancy fraud. 
Occupancy fraud is when the buyer deliberately misrepresent, misrepresents their use. They say, hey, I'm going to live in it, and then they end up not living in it, and they had the intention of renting it out at full time, the whole time, like an FHA loan. You have to declare that you're going to live in the property. Well, then you loan, you get the loan, you close on the house, and then you don't move into it, you rent it out, that would be an occupancy fraud, all right? They have straw buyer frauds. Sometimes you hear it called a fake buyer. A straw buyer is where you use some bogus buyer and you borrow their credit to get the loan because they typically have the better credit and the buyer and the money. And then as soon as the deal is complete, they quit claim it over to some other person, like a family member or something of that uh, kind of scenario. Now, in this scenario, you could actually get the straw buyer to actually be an identity theft buyer too. So there could be that straw buyer, and a lot of times people would say, oh, well, maybe a mom or a dad are gonna go out and get a loan and then deed the property to their kid because the kid couldn't do it. Yes, that's uh, still a straw buyer. But you can take it even one step further than that, is that fake buyer or that straw buyer may actually have had their identity stolen. It may not even be that person altogether. It could be someone stole the mother, mother's ID used it to buy a house and then deeded it to some other person. And in that case, you've got a couple of situations going. You know, you've got a straw buyer, you have identity theft. So all of those can happen. There's also home appraisal fraud. I don't have it in there, but there's a home appraisal fraud. I was just thinking as I'm doing this, uh, this is where the appraiser artificially inflates the value of the property higher than it could so that the current owner can skim equity out and get money out of a property that maybe does not have uh, equity in it. Because remember, the bank is relying on this professional called the appraiser. If the appraiser actually does something illegal, they may not know it. You see this happen a lot, maybe on refis, where the bank hires an appraiser, the appraiser goes out and says, hey, he's been doing a cash out refi, he, so the house is worth 200, he's gonna get 160,000, and the house is really only worth about 100 or 140, and he's got cash out, and then they just kind of disappear and the house goes into foreclosure. Once again, it could be in connection with identity theft, it could be in connection with a couple others. There's financial income fraud. Financial income basically is where the buyer gives false paperwork to bolster his lie about his income. All right, could it have to involve a buyer? May involve the mortgage broker. You know, maybe they falsified his paycheck to, from saying, 4,000 a month to 14,000 a month and submit that as proof to buy this large house and that is financial income fraud, all right? There's all kinds of other frauds. There's this one called a silent second fraud or a loan to value fraud. And this happens between the seller and the buyer. And if you remember this term called the purchase money mortgage, let's go back over here for a minute. Suppose you got a house that's going to get sold for a hundred thousand and uh, he can get an 80% loan to value and the seller takes back that 20,000 in purchase money mortgage. In this scenario, this is an 80% loan to value. In a silent second, in theory, when the seller takes this purchase money mortgage, he then doesn't record it and the seller is happy with the 80 grand, but in essence, what happened was the buyer bought the property for 80,000, the bank 
thought he bought it for 100 and the reality is now in this silent second scenario, what you have is there a 100% loan to value. That is also a mortgage fraud, all right? That can, that's going to take the buyer and the seller together to do that. So there are many, many different ways to do that. That's the silent second mortgage fraud. There is this thing that FHA calls the flipping fraud and I put the word in quotes because you have to understand that they have a slight different definition for the word flipping than I think you might have and I might have. I did a presentation in Ohio to the Ohio real estate investors and I was on stage and there was probably two or 300 people there and we were talking about flipping properties. And I was on stage talking about, you know, I flipped this property and I've flipped that property. And I could visually see these people freaking out, uh, you know, and they're like, oh, I, I can't. and after I got done, you know, I was talking to the MC and I'm like, you know, what was going on? And he said, well, in Ohio, they use the term flipping like the FHA does, meaning illegal flipping is where you artificially raise the price of a property you're selling. You just bought it, you artificially raise the price and sell it again, and you make the difference in the what you bought and what you sold it for. But the key is without doing any discernible modifications to the property, all right? That's the key for FHA. So what they're saying is you bought a house at 20, you turned around and then did nothing and resold it for 100,000, to some unsuspecting buyer and you made a bunch of money and you flipped that property without doing any rehab. Whereas I personally have used the word, always used the word, hey, I bought a house for 20. I did something to it, put a new bathroom in, redid the carpet, whatever, new roof. It's now worth more, but I actually did the property uh, I actually increased the value by doing work to it. So I was saying, hey, you know, I bought a property for 20 and then I flipped it and made a bunch of money and all these guys in the front row are freaking out. And later on, I literally had to go back up and they gave me five more minutes to explain my case. It was like, hey, look, first of all, I'm not doing anything illegal. I guess there was a difference in terminology in the Indiana market. We use the term flipping as not a bad word where they were actually using it consistently with what FHA does. And you can Google FHA flipping rule and there are things in place that keep you, keep a person from doing that. And you see this a lot of times, if you've ever seen a house that's listed for sale and then it'll say no FHA or VA loans accepted. One of the keys that it's cluing you in on this, not that it's illegal, but they still have a rule on how much a person could make even if they did do some work to it. And they do that by not allowing the buyer to have money. So if a seller bought a property for 50 and is, even if he did rehab it, he's trying to sell it for uh, 150 or 200, the buyer coming in cannot use an FHA loan because there are rules. You know, they've got to hold the property for six months. They can only, if they do it for more than six months, they can make a hundred percent profit, but they have to have a second appraisal. If they want to sell it in less than six months, they can only make a 10% profit. And if you've spent more than that money in rehabbing it, you've got to hold it. So a lot of sellers will say, well, I'm not taking an FHA loan. I can buy a property for 50, do $10,000 worth of work, sell it for 150 to a cash buyer or a conventional loan, but I can't do it to an FHA person because FHA will not give the money to the buyer because they're afraid of the flipping fraud. All right. So keep that in mind. If you've got a seller that is an investor slash rehabber, that wants to buy properties and sell them, that there could potentially be a time frame uh, moratorium on the sale, specifically if it's a buyer coming in with one of the GSE loans.
all right? Now there's another fraud I wanna talk about that really is not typically mortgage fraud per se. <clears throat> it is this wire fraud. This is the issue, one of the issues we're worried about now with what they call the, what is it? Uh, mortgage, uh, the email interruption scam or the business email scam. And this is where they hack your email and what they do is they replace all of those numbers that we talked about earlier so that when the uh, buyer goes in, wires money, it does not wire to the actual bank, it wires to this offshore account and there you go. So there is that issue of uh, wire fraud. There's other types of scams out there that I don't even have listed on here you've got all of these other people that are trying to go on the other side. And what I mean by that is they are picking on people that already have problems. This is during the process of the conveyance. Once somebody gets into foreclosure or they're noticed they're having problems, there are people out there called the mortgage relief. There's a mortgage relief sometimes called the debt relief or mortgage foreclosure relief fraud, where they come in and say, hey, I can save you from foreclosure and here's how we do it. Deed me the property, I'll make the payments, you live in the house for rent, you pay me rent, I will own the property, and then what happens is they collect the rent and never make the payment and it ends up going into foreclosure. So there are people that are actually fraud, defrauding, not just the conveyance of real estate, but the people that are in trouble because of a normal situation. There's all kinds of fraud as well. All right. 